Welcome to the Creepin' It Real Show, your one-stop shop for weird news, spooky, and otherworldly and paranormal shenanigans. We'll take a dive into what's going on in creepy pop culture. You can follow Creepin' It Real Show on Twitter at creepin underscore it. You can email us at creepinitrealshow at gmail.com. You can also go to our website, creepinitrealshow.com. Hello, and welcome to the Creepin' It Real Show. I am one-third of your illustrious hosts, Miss Moni, um, and I want to throw it over first, I think, to Christy, the gal who records it all for your pleasure. Christy, Mm -hmm. how are you doing? Uh, I'm hanging in there. It's, you know, it's pretty rough being quarantined in your house. I used to be a pretty much like cool with hunkering down and not seeing people, but usually by my own choice, not necessarily the forced <laughs> quarantines that yeah, we're going through now. Sure. Uh, but we're hanging in there and getting through it. And I'm really thankful that my job allows me to work from home and that we haven't lost any income. So that's been a blessing. Uh, the kids are on spring break this week, and we were supposed to be at the beach, and of course, that's not happening, so they're not exactly thrilled at this moment, but you know what? They're alive and healthy, so priorities, I guess, right? Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, we're going to have... It's going to be fun to try to pull this up today, but that's okay, because we got a fun topic, but before we get into it, Yardley, how are you hanging in? Hey, I'm doing okay. Pretty much the same situation as Christy. I'm just chilling, not stir crazy yet. I just watch more TV and I (laughs) work from home, but that's about it. Nice. Well, I just want to say to everybody, hang in there. Um, I'm unemployed and have no health insurance right now. And I know that is the case with a whole lot of people across the country. And if you're trying also to work from home and you're you're lucky enough to be working, it's still a lot to do. So mm-hmm. um, hang in there, everybody. But uh, we're here to do some good escapist, <laughs> kind of like watching your TV right now more than we care to admit, some good escapist content. And today we're going to be talking about famously cursed movie sets. Um, actually, I was looking for TV shows, but it turned out to be so many movies that were supposedly cursed. Much of it probably coincidental, but we'll be discussing that. Before we get into it, though, um, our, our newer segment that we've been doing, especially during quarantine, is to talk about what we've been watching. Um, Yardley, what kind of you've been watching to pass the time? So I ended up finishing Containment, and, you know, it did about the same way that it started kind of, you know, muddling it, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it's worth a watch if you get an opportunity. And I'm pretty sure there are a lot of people uh, from their, cho- their choice or their own probably needs to do a lot of binge watching these days. Um, I would say if you have nothing to do to check it out, it's probably a four and a half or five out of 10 as far as a series is concerned, but it's only one season and it will not be renewed. I also watched this movie called Boar. It was on Shudder. Um, the movie's basically um, takes place in the Australian outback, and there is a huge wild boar that's out there that's ruthless, and it's just killing people just to be killing them uh, in true Shudder movie type fashion. <laughs> it's pretty. It's pretty cool. I mean, there are some times when they show shots of the boar, you can really see that their butt wasn't great. But there are other times where it looks kind of cool. So if you just want to, you know, just an animal killing people just for the hell of killing it out in the outback, I would probably recommend that one as well. Um, there was a movie that I was trying to describe to you when we were talking about the ills of some of these apps yeah. um, and how you can't don't all necessarily have a history. But it was a post-apocalyptic movie featuring a woman and her daughter after her husband had gotten killed. And so it basically follows her adventures of how to survive. I cannot remember the name of it. I can't find it in the queue. I have no idea. When I do, I will make sure that I post it on the Facebook page. Or if you know what he's talking about. As soon as you said, oh, go ahead. Go, go. If you guys know what he's talking about, please message us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram as well, because... Uh, it's really bugging him. <laughs> yeah, cause I, I think it came out in 2019 oh. or, or something. It's it's fairly current, but, but I mean, for some, I just can't find it. Like I don't, it, it, not a, not on Hulu. I can't find it on Netflix, and I can't find it on Shutter. And I literally watched it 24 hours. This podcast. Sure, it, it really exists. We believe you. <laughs> um. Well, 
Joe. Welcome to Chance Creeper. <laughs> Maybe it was a really cool dream. Uh, so, Christy, I saw, and then you said uh, animals killing people. And, like, right at that moment, my dog came out and was like, You rang? Like, <laughs> came up to me and was like, Animals killing people? We're in. Yeah. Look, I'm He's like, sure. I'm just waiting. What's I'm that? pretty sure y'all will enjoy boar, though, because it's just so, Sounds you know good. what I mean? Yeah. It, yeah. It's so averagely awesome. Right? <laughs> you know, watch it. But Creature it's got features. Of, we love it. It's got, the monsters. <laughs> it's got a lot of blood, you know what I'm saying? And it's got, mm-hmm. um, you know, the big tough guy. You know, you always have it. You have the weak guy. You have the big tough guy. And, you know, well, let's let's just say everybody loses, but it, it's, it's a <laughs> Uh, I love it. It sounds good. Actually, I'll probably end up checking that out. Thank you. And we'll look for whatever other movie you were talking about. Um, Christy, what have you been watching? I'm going to stop us right here really quick. Yeah, so I watched this really good movie on Netflix. I had never heard of it. Was um, It's Spanish, but honestly, they did a really good job with the um, dubbing because it's dubbed in English. And it's called Mirage. It got a 7.4 on IMDb. Um, it's... Basically, it says, two storms separated by 25 years, a woman murdered, a daughter missed, only 72 hours to discover the truth. It was really good. I enjoyed it. I thought the um, concept was really original and different. It's kind of like got time travel and all kinds of things in it. Uh, definitely nice. something you should check out. And the dubbing, sometimes dubs really bother me, but I didn't even notice this one. It was it was a really good movie. So definitely check that one out. And then I, cool. I also watched How to Fix a Drug Scandal on Netflix. Oh my gosh, this is the craziest fucking story. <laughs> Netflix is coming out hard with their documentaries. They are so good. And I have never been a documentary person. So thank you, Netflix, for getting me so hooked on these crazy documentaries. But I had never heard of this story. But in 2013, Massachusetts State Police arrest a 35-year-old crime drug lag chemist, Sonia Farrick, for tampering with evidence. Basically, she wasn't tampering with evidence. She was doing the drugs. So she was, there was like no oversight, no nothing. She was literally in labs by herself testing um, the drugs that basically they confiscate from arrests and doing them and like was on hardcore drugs. And this is the story. And then another one came out also who was not on drugs, but was just doing what they call dry labbing in the same state, but in a different town. Um, She just wanted to get ahead at work. And so she was saying that she ran tests on the drugs, but didn't. And then just, so she was churning out like five times the drug lab results as the rest of her lab people and came to find out that she wasn't really testing them at all. And so she got arrested as well. And then the whole situation of what did they do about all these people that were prosecuted based on these certificates that they had tested these drugs and said that they were legit. Um, it's a really good documentary series, highly recommended. And at the end of it, you're just like, holy shit, how could they have gone with no oversight for these lab people? That is bananas. No cameras, no nothing. So it will it will f- completely blow you away. Definitely recommend that one. Um, I also nice. watched The Girl with All the Gifts on Netflix. It's kind of a zombie apocalypse horror. It was good. I don't know if I liked the ending. I, I thought it was really good to the ending, and then I was kind of like, eh, really? Could have been a stronger ending. I don't know. But I thought the concept was really good, and I don't quite know what the girl with all the gifts means. I don't know why they think she had all the gifts. I'm not quite sure. I still don't know what that meant, but it's a good movie nonetheless. And it's, you know, if you have Netflix, it's definitely worth a watch for free for sure. Then my last one is I'm watching this British Netflix series that's basically Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but with demons called Crazy Head. Mm -hmm. I had never watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It was, that was past my generation. Um, Mm. But I didn't really have any interest. I, and you know, I caught it a couple of times when it was on, but I just, it never held my interest. This is pretty good. It's really funny. There's, you know, the British dry humor. It's basically, you know, Shaun of the Dead 
type humor, but with young, like, girls, white, you know, out of college um, who are demon slayers. So it's pretty funny. There's some interesting <laughs> concepts to it. And <laughs> I've had a couple of giggles here and there watching it. So definitely something to check out. Also, one more thing, and I didn't announce this because I'm still kind of trying to figure out um, when officially we're going to do, when I'm going to post this episode, but I was thinking about starting Black Mirror from scratch coming this coming weekend while I'm up in the mountains and doing like a Netflix watch party with it. So I will officially commit to posting this show before that so that you can listen and we will have the link shared out on our socials for anybody who wants to join. I think that's a fun way to, I already committed to a friend that we would do it. So then we already decided, well, we'll just share it, you know, with everybody else since we're going to be on there. And if anybody wants to join, great. It's not anything official or it's not official creeping it real on the calendars. It was just something my friend from middle school who's in Texas and I talked about doing and then we thought oh we'll send it out and make it an official watch party so that's all I got nice that'll be cool that sounds fun <laughs> as fun as watching reality <laughs> stylized right? black mirror <laughs> but <laughs> it's a great series so that should be nice to to go through again I guess and she's um, never seen it so I think it oh, would wow. be a fun you know people oh, who good. have Start seen it the first episode that's a good way yes to- <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what I want to do is, oh, we got to watch it. Because I had been talking about doing it anyway. So it was like, man, I want to rewatch all of those. They were so good. And and then she texted me and was like, I need show recommendations. And I'm like, well, first and foremost, if you haven't seen Black Mirror, it's a priority. Like, And then as we were talking, we decided to do the watch party. And then it kind of grew from there. <laughs> nice. Very cool. Yeah, we've been doing, and actually that goes into what I've been watching is uh been watching a lot of shows on like the, the the travel channel cheesy stuff um but we did get a recommendation from a listener or yeah from a from a creeper to watch the shadows of history because one of their friends was actually in the show mm-hmm. but i at first the episode that i was watching was the newest one and i was like oh it's a little bit slow and then it turned out to be freaking fascinating oh, and really well that. put together um, and it's Robert England, so I mean, he's the host. You can't, you should watch it if you have access to Travel Channel, which apparently, uh, YouTube TV, you can get access through there. You can get access through Prime, I believe, like with an app, Shadows of History. Um, and then the reboot, I actually mutual colleagues, uh, Bazaar Los Angeles. Uh, we follow each other on Instagram and I follow a lot of the things that they do out my way. And they actually said that the only ghost quote unquote reality show that they will ever really um, condone would be the reboot of the ghost hunters. So the original ghost Hunters series has been at an end. And now one of the two guys that originated it has come back with a new team. And apparently just the the ethics involved with how they do things, the reasons why they do them and how they conduct their investigations are apparently pretty above board in the paranormal world. But how is they don't do any of that cussing. They're not running and screaming all the time. You don't get shaky cam. But what you do get is very interesting historical, you know, backstories of things, people's evidence, debunking of evidence, and some inability to debunk. So I highly recommend the reboot of Ghost Hunters. It is available on A&E, and I've watched episodes last night, but I've been doing live watch parties with friends, and that's been pretty fun to just talk about what we think about things. Um, And then the other thing that I had heard about and ended up watching and enjoying, Yardley uh, also watched it. It's called Cursed Films, and it's on Shudder which uh, again, we have beefs with how Shudder's content is put together, how to find things, but the show itself, I enjoyed. Yardley, did you end up in, in Cursed Films? Did you like the episode? Yeah, I thought it was cool. I think Netflix has me spoiled with being able to just have, you know, more content available. Yeah. It was good enough to make me, you know, wish that there was another one. Um, I definitely would recommend it. I thought that it was um it was thoughtful and it covered a covered a bunch of very interesting things. And I did not notice what the next one would be. Did you do you know what the next one's gonna no, be? No, and actually I was gonna mention I've actually tried to find information about it and I can't find it's supposed to come weekly. 
but it doesn't give any idea of when because I watched it last Sunday and then this past Sunday came around and I still don't see another episode available. I haven't checked this morning. Um, I did check Monday and I didn't see one. So I don't know what weekly means to them, but I have not seen another episode drop, nor was I able to find information in Googling or anything like that. So anyway, Cursed Films on Shudder definitely it was inspired, good. inspired. Yeah, it inspired this show. Um, and there were, I actually started looking at so allegedly cursed movies and there were so many I had to actually cut it down to just what's in our vein of interest as far as horror movies because I swear every like coincidental disaster that happened to every movie everybody's like it's clearly cursed (laughs) so um if you think that we're all cursed right now I'd like to share some famously bad luck film and and film projects some of you some of some you may have heard of some you may have not But all of them are crazy and entertaining stories, so let's dive in. Our sources for this are Looper, BuzzFeed, Bustle, Wikipedia, Pop Sugar, and The 13th Floor. Yardley, can you tell us about the curses from The Exorcist? With pleasure. Um, The set of The Exorcist inexplicably burned down and ended up delaying the film for six weeks. Actor Jack McGowran, who portrayed alcoholic director Denning Burke, died suddenly just one week after he completed his role in the film. During the notorious masturbation scene, Ellen Burstyn hurt her back and had to lie in bed for weeks afterward. The scene where the audience sees her react in pain that his fall is no shit real. Mm. (laughs) Uh, During, so you know what that reminds me of? Have you ever watched the behind the scene things for like Die Hard, the first Die Hard, you know, when the guy's falling off the building at at the end? um, How they were saying that that reaction was real because they dropped him without letting him know. So it kind of <laughs> makes yeah. me think about that. That's crazy. But that really, but that really does um, suck. And you know what? When you're talking about bad accidents that happen on movies or whatever, or a television series, remember back in the day, Christy will probably remember this. Um, there was a show before, when Red Fox had died mm-hmm. and he had a heart attack on set. And remember that was his bit from Sanford and Son and everybody oh, thought geez. that he was faking it. Yes. But he really, but he really had the heart attack on set and died. Yes. So. Oh, sh- yeah, there's plenty of this stuff to kind of go around. <laughs> I, that, but that's got to be a total bad way to go with everybody totally thinking you're laughing. Playing and it's, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? And then it, it really did. It took them a long time to realize that it was real. But, um, it's your yeah. comedian to the end, right? Yep. Well, Leave them laughing. <laughs> Um, so during the scenes where Linda Blair's character Reagan is violently writhing on the bed, rigs were tied to the little girl's body and controlled by multiple men. They jerked Blair's young body hard enough to cause lower spine fractures. Uh, the filming didn't stop as the crew brought Blair's screaming and uh, as the crew thought that Blair's screaming and crying were a result of her superb acting skills. The scenes of her actual injury are in the film. Um, seems like that type of stuff is pretty infectious. Uh, the location trip to Iraq was pushed from spring when the weather is milder to the summer, the hottest part of the year, which meant that half the crew were struck down with sunstroke or dysentery. Wow. Um, both a night watchman died and a special effects operator passed away during the making of the film. And things got so bad that the director asked the Jesuit priest to exercise the set. However, he decided to bless it instead. There were no other disturbances after that. So in L.A., it was estimated that every screening of the film prompted four blackouts and six cases of vomiting. <laughs> and many <Good> people <laughs> leaving, the, uh, leaving the film halfway through it. So in New York, several people suffered heart attacks during the film. It has been claimed. And one woman had a miscarriage. So Linda Blair suffered years of stigma for her betrayal as Reagan in public. People would run for fear, run in fear from her or offer unwanted prayers for the salvation of her soul and sometimes physically accost her. Uh, This is, you know, this just goes to show you like how people can't really understand what acting is. Uh (laughs) Yeah. But I guess if you're a writer or you're that actress, as annoying as that might be, it just goes to show you that you kind of killed it because people totally can't separate, you know, you from the role. So I think that that is interesting. And it's kind of, this is just kind of messed up. I mean, just kind of going back to what we were uh, briefly talking about earlier about how people think that you're acting. <laughs> but yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the thing is, is like the worst scenes of the movie, she was, that wasn't even her. So they're like her. putting... Yep. 
putting all the horrible stuff, oh, she must be tainted and, and evil because she acted through that. Well, it wasn't her. And so they were all portraying prayers onto somebody in memory of what somebody else was actually make and costumed doing on her yeah. behalf. So yeah. it's just funny how people are kind of idiots about that stuff but what are you gonna do craziness i'm so happy that you gave me this one and i know I you did, did because really you long, know but it's a good story that's so okay I took half of it but yeah <laughs> i was fascinated with this story because you know i love me some twilight zone and i am currently still watching you know tracking it through all the twilight zone episodes on netflix it's just and i was just talking to rick about it the other day it's like comforting to me to watch when i go to sleep it's so old and everybody's like, and it's hysterical for me to hear like when you're watching one of the actors talk and they're supposed to be in their 20s and they look like they're in like their 40s or 50s because they smoke and they all lived unhealthy, hard lives back then. And it's just fascinating to me to watch the show and portraying, you know, topics that are actually surprisingly on point now, but from so long ago and it's so crazy it's just it's twilight zone watching the twilight zone really um so i love i've always loved the twilight zone and even the movies and when this happened it was just horrifying what happened to these people and yes the talk of it being cursed was very very um pronounced and prolonged especially when it came out in the movies and it was bizarre so this is um, based on the movie, The Twilight Zone, not the show. So on July 23rd, 1982, a Bell UH-1 Iroquois helicopter crashed at Indian Dunes in Santa Clarita, California during the making of Twilight Zone, the movie. The crash killed three people on the ground and injured the six helicopter passengers. The film featured four sequences, one of which was based on the 1961 Twilight Zone episode, A Quality of Mercy, named in supplementary materials as Time Out. In the script, character Bill Connor Morrow is transported back in time to the midst of the Vietnam War, where he has become a Vietnamese man protecting two children from American troops. Director John Landis violated California's child labor laws by hiring seven-year-old Micah Din Lee and six-year-old Renee Shen Yi Chen without the required permits. Landis and several other staff members were also responsible for a number of labor violations connected with other people involved in the accident, which came to light after the incident. Lee and Chen were being paid under the table to circumvent California's child labor laws, which did not permit children to work at night. Landis opted not to seek a special waiver, either because he did not think he would get permission for such a late hour or because he knew he would not get approval to have young children in a scene with a large number of explosives. The casting agents were unaware that the children would be involved in the scene. Associate producer George... Folsley Jr. told the children's parents not to tell any firefighters on the set that the children were part of the scene and hid them from a fire safety officer who also worked as a welfare, welfare worker. The night scene called for Marrow's character to carry the two children out of a deserted village and across a shallow river while being pursued by American soldiers and a hovering helicopter. The helicopter was piloted by Vietnam War veteran Dorsey Wingo. During the filming, Wingo stationed his helicopter 25 feet from the ground while hovering near a large mortal effect, mortar effect. He then turned the aircraft 180 degrees to the left for the next camera shot. The effect the effect was detonated while the helicopter's tail rotor was still above it, causing the rotor to fail and detach from the tail. The low-flying helicopter spun out of control. At the same time, Moro dropped Chen into the water. He was reaching out to grab her when the helicopter fell on top of him and the two children. Moro and Lee were decapitated by the helicopter's main rotor blades while Chen was crushed to death by the helicopter's right landing skid. All three died instantaneously, you think? At the trial, the defense claimed that the explosions were detonated at the wrong time. 
Randall Robinson was an assistant cameraman on board the helicopter, and he testified that production manager Dan Allingham told Wingo, that's too much, let's get out of here, when the explosions were detonated. But Landis shouted over the radio, get lower, lower, get over. Robinson said that Wingo tried to leave the area, but that we lost our control and regained it, and then I could feel something let go, and we began spinning around in circles. Bam. Yeah, there's a lot of instances, and I've cut out some of it, but you're going to hear some of it where the director intentionally basically put everyone in danger and, you know, also was just known to shrug off concerns from the cast about anything else. So, Stephen Lydecker, also a camera operator on board, testified that Landis had either shrugged off warnings about the stunt with the comment, we may lose the helicopter. Lydecker acknowledged that Landis might have been joking when he made the remark, but he said, I learned not to take anything the man said as a joke. It was his attitude. He didn't have time for suggestions from anybody. The accident led to civil and criminal action against the filmmakers, which lasted nearly a decade. Lee's father, Daniel Lee, testified that he heard Landis instructing the helicopter to fly lower. All four parents testified that that they were never told that there would be helicopters or explosives on the set. And they had been reassured that there would be no danger, only noise. Lee survived the Vietnam War and immigrated with his wife to the United States and was horrified when the explosions began on the Vietnamese village set, bringing back memories of the war. Landis Folsey Wingo, production manager Ailingham, and explosive specialist Paul Stewart were tried and acquitted on charges of manslaughter in a nine-month trial in 1986 and 87. Morrow's family settled within a year. The children's families collected millions of dollars from several civil lawsuits. As a result of the accident, second assistant director Andy House had his name removed from the credits and replaced with the pseudonym Alan Smithy. It was also the first time that the director was charged due to a fatality on the set. The trial was described as long, controversial, and bitterly divisive. Screen Actors Guild spokesman Mark Locher said that the conclusion of the trial, the entire ordeal has shaken the industry from top to bottom. Warner Brothers set up a dedicated safety committee to establish acceptable standards for every aspect of filmmaking, from gunfire to fixed wing aircraft to smoke and pyrotechnics. There was a lot of change in the industry, and again, I cut some of that out, Mm -hmm. but um, it did cause a lot of good changes in the industry, but it still wasn't worth it. Landis spoke about the accident in a 1996 interview. There was absolutely no good aspect about this whole story. The tragedy, which I think about every day, had an enormous impact on my career Mm. from which it may possibly never recover. Yeah. An enormous impact on his career. The poor baby. Can you guys imagine losing your multi-million dollar career over, I don't know, getting children decapitated on Mm -hmm. your set? (laughs) Filmmaker Steven Spielberg co-produced the film with Landis, but broke off their friendship following the accident. Spielberg said that the crash made me grow up a little more and left everyone who worked on the movie sick to the center of our souls. He added that no movie is worth dying for. I think people are standing up much more now than ever before to producers and directors who ask too much. If something isn't safe, it's the right and responsibility of every actor or crewmaker to yell cut. Yep. So that's a lovely one. But going into The Crow, which is another, yeah. <laughs> another sad one. Um, so The Crow is a movie that most of us probably remember. And on the first day of shooting, a crew member had to be hospitalized after a crane ran into a power cable and he suffered burns over 90% of his body. A construction driver drove a screwdriver through his own hand. I don't know how you do that. A set sculptor drove his car through the prop rooms, that's not funny, but also, and completely destroyed it. And most of the set was destroyed by a storm, which in L.A. is pretty hard to do. The most devastating tragedy occurred when the young star, Brandon Lee, was shot dead while shooting the film. A metal tip from a fake bullet had been lodged in the prop gun that was being used for the scene, which then lodged into his abdomen. Shortly after Lee's death, a film was produced by his mother and his fa- about his father's life titled Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. In a scene at the end, Bruce Lee is fighting a demon, but it loses interest in him and goes after his son instead. The film was released just two months after Brandon's death. Bruce Lee died in 1973 after shooting a film called Game of Death. In the film, he plays an actor who is shot after gangsters replace 
a fake bullet with a live one, in circumstances similar to those of his son's death 20 years later. This, that movie came out, gosh, I was probably 20, 19 or 20 at the time. And we were just like so stoked about The Crow. It was just so perfect for, at the time, you know, dark, moody, you know, just this typical 90s grungy type movie for the times that we were in. And when he died, it was like shocking. I mean, we were just shocked. I mean, me and my group of friends and boyfriends and everybody, we were just more seriously mourned the guy when he died. It was just shocking and very upsetting, and it really sucked. It really stuck with me. I haven't watched the movie since. I just haven't been able to. I don't know why. It's just such a crazy thing to happen so needlessly. Like, how does that happen? It's just bizarre. Yeah. Very random and very, yeah, not not a good situation. Mm-mm. All right. The Passion of the Christ. During the filming of the scene and the Passion of the Christ portraying the Sermon on the Mount, the star, Jim, is, is it Caviezel? Well, Sounds right. Is it, yeah. Uh, well, Jim Caviezel was struck by lightning. Mm. Assistant director Jan Michelini was also struck twice by lightning during the film's production. Playing the role of Jesus Christ took its toll upon Caviezel. He dislocated his shoulder while performing the crucifixion scenes, struggled against hypothermia, and got a lung infection and pneumonia. Caviezel also suffered painful skin infections from the makeup used to depict his gruesome injuries in the film. The fact that two people got struck by lightning and there were three (laughs) were combined three times... I think that you probably want to stay away from that spot. Like, did, did, <laughs> agreed. Upon first, I mean, I don't know how deep y'all read into this, but did it say that they were struck in the same spot, or like was this just randomly two different spots? I think it was two different spots. And my husband was like, "Well, that's normal during a lightning storm because he's trying to say everything is a coincidence." I'm like, "I don't know, man. Some of this <laughs> in this whole thing is like pretty messed up." <laughs> being struck by lightning, one person being struck by lightning. In a certain circumstance of group of people is crazy, but it happening that many times is that's really that that's really crazy. But but I the, I think that that kind of stands to be in the weird things that happen on sets. The whole thing about dislocating your shoulder, getting Those hypothermia, happen, yeah. tons of actors are like, "Welcome to the fucking club, yeah, bruh." But <laughs> being struck by lightning twice, but the lightning, yeah, that gets you. That, that uh, gets you. And then, uh, yeah, I'd quit. <laughs> I'm out. Thanks. Two times by lightning and I'm still alive. I'm going to go ahead and uh, quit. Uh, There is no amount of assistant director uh, that I could do that would keep me after being struck by lightning twice and living through it. I just like... (laughs) You know, that other stuff, I guess, you know, somebody like Tom Cruise will be like, hold my beer on your right. little dislocated shoulder, buddy. Yeah, I'm going to go jump from this helicopter and break bone the bones yeah. of my body. <laughs> oh, yeah, you gave me another one of my favorites, Poltergeist. Yeah. My You're favorite welcome. horror movie of all time is Poltergeist. And I truly did believe growing up that this movie, the movies of Poltergeist, because there were several, um, were haunted and cursed for sure. I believed the hype on that one when I was a kid. Um, I just, and I love the movie more than anything. I'm not a fan of the, uh, sequels, but the first one scared the living shit out of me when I was a kid and Mm. I loved it. (laughs) So, um, one of the most famous scenes features Joe Beth Williams character, Diane falling into the family's pool and it's filled with skeletons. Those skeletons are actually real. The actors sure didn't know. No, they didn't. Can you even believe that? In my innocence and naivety, I assumed that these were not real skeletons, Williams said in an interview for TV Land. I assumed that they were prop skeletons made out of plastic or rubber. I found out, as did the crew, that they were using real skeletons because it was far too expensive to make fake skeletons out of rubber. Can you fucking imagine that? Holy shit, that would freak me out. find out later, it was like so unethical to just be like, I've been rolling around with real dead people yes. for who knows how many hours filming that scene. Jesus. Poltergeist was released in June 1982, and in November of that year, 22-year-old Dom- Dominique Dune, who played Dana, the family's older daughter, was murdered. Dune was brutally strangled by her in her own driveway by her abusive ex-boyfriend and was removed from life support five days later. I love watching her dad's shows, Dominique Dune. Um, he is 
very dedicated to solving murders to this day. Um, actually, I think he passed away, but he's got a lot of shows on um, True TV that he used to do that are really good. Oh. Concerned about the use of real skeletons on the set of the first film, Native American actor and Poltergeist 2, the other side star, Will Sampson, performed an exorcism on the set of the second film in 1984. According to Williams, he went to the set late at night by himself to do it. The next day, the cast supposedly felt relieved. The untimely passing of Poltergeist's iconic young star is perhaps perhaps the most convincing case for the curse. Heather O'Rourke, a.k.a. Carol Ann, who said the famous line, They're here, was incredibly young when she died of cardiac arrest and septic shock caused by a misdiagnosed intestinal issue. She died in February 1988 at 12, several months before the release of Poltergeist 3, the final chapter in the original series. First of all, if you saw pictures of her right before she died, the fact that they did she not know sick. she was ill is absolutely yeah. shocking to me. She's swollen. She looks horrible. That just, to me, is parent neglect of, of any proportion. Just getting her through this movie, I mean, she died because of it. They could have saved her life by um, taking her out of the film and getting her the di- medical help she needed. In 2009, a cast member was brutally murdered. Lou Perryman played the small role of Pugsley in the original film. He was 67 years old when a recently released ex-convict killed him in his own home with an axe. Jesus. Well, I mean, it's like that's, I'm sure, a coincidence, but it's also just like, I had to add it in because I'm like, it's an axe murder. It's not yeah. just like, he didn't just die of cardiac arrest. Like, no. Like, he fucking got murdered with an axe after working on this movie. It's just... It's crazy. There's a, it does seem to be a disproportion if you mapped everyone's life and people they know. Yeah. Like... Do you know someone who's been murdered with an axe? Probably not. Like, <laughs> you know, and yeah. everyone on this movie is like, yep, we know someone who died before they were 12. We know someone who was murdered with an axe. We know, like, it's just kind of nuts. And, you, you do, know, like, a tree of these things. Oh, go ahead. The whole skeleton thing, it just to me is just disrespectful to the dead. Like, I oh. don't care how much it costs to make fake skeletons. Where did they get these? Like, how did this happen that somebody agreed? to throw these people that were alive and died into a pool for a movie. I I just, it, I mean, clearly they were like unclaimed. I just, it's in my brain. It doesn't compute that they thought that was okay. It just doesn't set you up for good, you know, juju anyway, regardless of, of where they came from or how, you know, these murders and deaths happened, you know, whatever science and, you know, critical thinking you want to put behind it it's like mm-hmm. why would you do that it's just i would i would freak out if i knew i was like working on a set and they were using real skeletons which nobody knew which is probably why they didn't say anything because i don't think very many people would have responded very well yeah. to it regardless if you were floating around in the pool or if you were just standing there watching it it just uh uh-uh, no fucking way <sighs> So the Amityville Horror, which y'all know by now is one of my favorite scary stories. I personally don't believe that the that the original haunting this was all based off of, that the book was based off of, is real. But I still find it to be one of the most cool, scary stories. I think just because of how old I was when I read it. And like, you know, it just kind of captured me. But at any rate, um, both films, and just know that I actually cut some stuff out because there were even more crazy things that I kind of chalked up to coincidence, but this, this story could go on and on. So the original in 1979, directed by Stuart Rosenberg, was known as one of the many horror films based on the true story. The Amityville Horror is about a real-life family who was shot and killed by their oldest son, Ro- Ronald DeFeo. And that, that actually happened. So what many can only speculate about is what exactly led Ronald DeFeo to commit the heinous crime. Some say that he was possessed and heard voices, but to what extent did that drive a person to kill his own family? The story behind the Amityville horror still bewilders people to this day. Actor James Brolin, who plays the father in the original film, George Lutz, was he- hesitant about accepting the role. After, he, after reading the novel, he arrived to a very tense part when suddenly his pants fall off a hanger, causing him to jump out of his chair in terror. After this occurrence, he agreed to take the role believing that there was something to this story. So one night, Ed and Lorraine Warren, who you'll remember of of many other things, the real-life couple who inspired the Conjuring movies, 
investigated the scene by placing cameras all around the house. They found one of the pictures, a young boy with glowing white eyes. Many have said that the boy is the ghost of John Matthew DeFeo, the eldest of the children who, of course, was shot to death by his older brother. There are many conspiracies on whether it was John Matthew, a photographer, or a demon revealing itself as a human or something else entirely. To this day, there's still no confirmation. While the Warrens were investigating at the Amityville house, they came home to horror of their own. One night, Ed was in his office. The latch on the end of the passageway snapped open, and he heard heavy footsteps approaching his office. No, thank you. So, in the 2005 remake, which apparently Ryan Reynolds said that somebody actually died right in front of the the house that they were filming in. Somebody died in the lake, like, right the first week they started filming. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, Ryan Reynolds, who plays George Lutz, reported that he and other crew members kept waking up at 3.15 a.m. every day which was the time that Ronald DeFeo murdered his parents and four siblings. This happens to Ryan's character also in the film. Just before, yeah, this was it. Just before filming began, a dead body washed up on the shore by the film set, which was completely bizarre. Today, the house is for sale with a different address and some structural changes, but many will always remember the terrifying history and that remains in the house. It actually isn't for sale. There's a family living in it and um, the windows in the front. I think they've revamped it so you can't really... You'd have to. ...drive by and be like, those are the demon eye windows yep. from the original Amityville mm-hmm. haunting. So as far as I know, that, that family or whoever's in it now has not had any issues. I can't... I, I have such a hard time believing... Like, I, I, to me, when you have something like this, these kinds of stories, there's just, I'm on the, where there's smoke, there's fire thing. It really, really, I have a really hard time believing that something isn't there in that house. Like, I just do. Yeah, I'm I'm excited for us to talk about all that at the end because I think Yardley will have a very different opinion on whether it's coincidental or not, but we'll see. So um, let's, let's get through the rest of the movies and then, yeah, we'll have that discussion. All right, well, let's talk about The Possession. In an interview with Gizmodo, actors Jeffrey Dean Morgan and Natasha Callis made it clear they wanted nothing to do with the original Dibbit box that inspired 2012's The Possession. The plot of the film has nothing to do with the story that went viral in the early 2000s of a cabinet purchased on eBay that reportedly brought misfortune to everyone who handled it. The urban legend says that the source of the mishaps is the Dibbit box. In Jewish folklore, an evil spirit that possesses the living. But the curse may have followed the box regarding the changes made for the movie. I'm a skeptic. Look, I'm not going to lie. That being said, there was some weird goings on on set. Lots of the light bulbs exploding, Morgan told Gizmodo. Just overall kind of creepiness. Don't mock the box was sort of the mantra that we lived by while we were filming this. Prior to this, had y'all heard about the Dibbit Box? Because there was a podcast that I used to listen to back in the day called Mysterious Universe, and they did a long podcast on this Dibbit Box uh, thing. This was years ago. It was a very interesting story because they kind of ran down the people who possessed the box Mm -hmm. uh, through a certain amount of years. Um, I really did like that podcast. I haven't listened to it in ages, but that was one of the main things that they talked about on that show that I will always remember. So if you ever have a chance, you might want to Google, um, you know, the Dibbit Box Mysterious Universe podcast and um, take a listen. I mean, they really got into it. And I always thought that that story was pretty cool, but I never did know about um, the possession. So now I'm like, I got to go. I got to watch it. You know, I know it can't out. live. Yeah, I know it can't live up to all the stuff yeah. that they talked about, sure. but now I'm really curious. I okay. um I think I've seen this movie. I'm trying to remember, but I have I have seen the there's been several episodes done on like haunted shows about the story, about the man that purchased the cabinet on eBay, kind of made fun of it and kind of did it, you know, like basically as a joke and then ended up uh, selling it to a guy that did like dealt with antiques and then he gave it to his mother who then had a stroke when he gave it to her and it's bizarre what happened and then he had to get rid of it and he locked it in like a I can't remember where he locked it in a closet or a shed like a shed or something anyway really interesting really bizarre and I have seen him tell the story so many times it's fascinating to me I you know of course I'm not Jewish so I had never heard of it but 
like you, Yardley, I had heard of it a while back, but not on the podcast. I had watched it on an episode of some TV shows that like The Haunting or The Haunted or whatever, you know, those ones that they have. But yeah, that's freaking crazy. I can't imagine it actually like being on the set of a movie with it there. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. All right. Next, we'll talk about The Shining. Oh, yeah. Good one. <laughs> Stanley Kubrick was never known as an easygoing director. He you know shit. But he really <laughs> turned up the intensity for The Shining. According to actor Scatman Carruthers, Kubrick demanded 87 takes of Shelley Duvall, Jack Nicholson, and Danny Lloyd silently walking across the street. That's taking auteur theory to a whole new level. Though Nicholson and Carruthers enjoyed making the film, Shelley Duvall was a different story. Kubrick tortured the actress by keeping her isolated from the rest of the cast and crew and constantly berating her. The worst was forcing her to do the give me the bat scene 127 times. Try pretending like Nike, Nike, bleh, let me start that over. Try pretending like Jack Nicholson is going to kill you once. That's already exhausting. Doing it 127 times will lead to a breakdown, which it did. Duval was so stressed out that she actually began losing clumps of her hair. Jesus. After The Shining, Duval largely retired from acting, and some wonder if Kubert's bullying put an early end to her Hollywood career. However, Duval's terrible treatment wasn't the only tragedy to befall The Shining. Later in the shoot, a massive fire broke out and destroyed two sound stages, one of which was the set for the infamous bat scene. They never found out what started the 11 alarm fire that was so destructive. Damn. That's crazy. And I also wonder if it's something sort of like what we saw in The Exorcist, where it's like the real performance where she seems so like well brilliantly acted where she's falling apart as yeah, she, she is literally losing apart. her mind yeah <laughs> <laughs> nice. jesus so the omen before the shoot began for the omen gregory peck's son committed suicide Ugh. shortly after two planes carrying craft cast and crew were reportedly struck by lightning and things got especially cra- creepy when a trainer in the um in charge of the baboons, was killed by a tiger a day after the monkey attack sequence, which I just had to laugh at with all the tiger shit going on right now. So the animal handler who helped organize the scene was with the frenzied baboon. Yeah, the tiger actually killed him the day after the filming. And despite all the weirdness, the film was released in the UK uh, on 6676 to critical acclaim. However, shortly after it was released, the special effects director was involved in a car crash which killed his girlfriend. She was decapitated in a way that was identical to a death in the film. Allegedly, a sign by the wreckage read, Omen 66KM. The creepiest thing? It happened on Friday the 13th of August in 1976. On top of all that, stuntman Alf Joint was injured while working on a World War II film after performing the same jump on The Omen. Even the 2006 remake was not safe from Satan's handiwork. According to director John Moore, all of the footage of the scene where Damien's true nature is revealed mysteriously disappeared. Occasionally, you lose a shot, Moore said later, maybe a roll. We lost 13,000 feet of, of film. Jesus Christ. Of course, the remake got off much lighter than the original, but that still does not make sense. And it only received a fraction of the curse because it was only a fraction as good of a movie. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) All right. Um, um, Apocalypse Now. So shooting the film was an absolute nightmare. The weather was horrible. Martin Sheen had to replace Harvey Keitel after two weeks. And the cast and crew were consistently battling tropical diseases. On top of that, the set was just too realistic. The place was strewn with dead rats and filth. And the set designer planned on using actual dead bodies as props. Fortunately, the producer wasn't having it and ordered the corpses all what? off set. The fact that you bring the corpses and then like, hey, let's do this. <laughs> God. You, just, you know what I mean? I think you should probably ask uh, first. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
making thing now. I want to know what the hell, you know what I'm saying? Where did they get them? How do you, you know, just get, get corpses? Them? Yeah, there's no like know. corpse catalog. I don't know no, unless no, you went to like tell. unless <laughs> you went to like the FBI yard that they use for training, you know, people met in going into the medical field. They have like a corpse basically a field where they put dead bodies out to rot so that you can learn how to judge how long a dead body's been dead like by the bugs and everything so yeah. I, the only thing i can imagine where they would go like <laughs> well, it, well, it depends on where you are there's probably tons of places where poor people pass away and, yeah. and they have to get rid of those bodies probably. i just you know i'm not shocked that he was able to find so, you know, Definitely not in bodies. the United States. <laughs> like, yeah. So uh, making things more complicated, Marlon Brando was overweight. Uh, he didn't know the script, demanded to be shot only in a shadow, <laughs> <laughs> and wanted to improvise everything. As for Martin Sheen, he had a heart attack, and director Francis Ford Coppola suffered a seizure before having a nervous breakdown and allegedly threatening suicide three times. Jesus. Luckily, the film was a huge success, cementing Coppola as an all-time legend, although we're pretty sure he'll never shoot a war film in the jungle again. I don't blame him. That's, oh man, that, but that's a lot of stress too. You, you know what I mean? So some of this stuff, you know, I think a lot of people just undersell. People who work on these movies is just overpaid, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of pressure and a lot of stress in, in production houses. I, I don't even, people really don't realize how hard and stressful uh, these jobs are. Hell yeah. Um, All the millions yeah, I, of I, dollars at stake and people I, depending I, I, on you and... Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's not only you, it's you and everybody working up on, you know, up under you, you know, like you having your job or you getting fired can affect the next person down. Remember, George Lucas had a heart attack filming mm -hmm. that first, you know, Star Wars movie. It just seems like anything that is wrong with you, the stress of creating a film will bring it out, apparently. Totally. All right. Now we're going to move on to Rosemary's Baby. Producer William Castle received a letter while making Rosemary's Baby, which read... Bastard, believer of witchcraft, worshiper at the shrine of Satanism, my prediction is you will slowly rot during a long and painful illness which you have brought upon yourself. Shortly after, he collapsed and he required immediate surgery. However, the condition was persistent and returned over several months. During one admission, Castle was heard to scream, Rosemary, for God's sake, drop the knife. The composer of the film's score, Christoph Komeda, died in a hospital from a hematoma of the brain in a way which eerily resembled Hutch's death in the film. It has been long been rumored that Anton LaVey, the black pope of the Church of Satan, acted as technical advisor in the film, and he played the devil in the scene where Rosemary is raped by the devil. This is not true. However, LaVey was friends with Susan Adkins, a member of the Manson family, who was sentenced to death for her role in the murder of Roman Polanski's wife, Sharon Tate, one year later. Wow. That's messed yeah, up. I love that movie. A lot of craziness <laughs> in Hollywood. Yeah, I got to revisit it because I think I watched it when I was little and I found it to be slow. And so I never really kind of like saw it again. But I'm reading yeah. these stories and I'm like, oh, I got to check it out just for this reason alone. So. For sure. The Abyss. James Cameron has made many successful blockbusters, but The Abyss isn't one of them. Only earning $54 million domestically on a $70 million budget, the failure had to sting even worse since the shoot was filled with nearly fatal accidents. The main set of The Abyss was filmed inside an abandoned nuclear reactor, but while there was no radioactive material on the site, the cast and crew spent hours filming underwater. Ed Harris had to film a scene where his helmet fills with water while being dragged 30 feet down into a tank. When he couldn't hold his breath any longer, a diver waited nearby to give him a regu regulator. Not surprisingly, he knew how you would signal to the diver that you can't breathe while you're still trying to film. Scarier still, Cameron got so wrapped up in filming that his oxygen tank ran out. The director tried to use the underwater PA OK to call for help, but the nearby cinematographer couldn't hear him. That's something maybe you test. <laughs> yeah. It's even worse when you realize that Cameron was in a 7.5 million gallon tank, 35 feet below, trapped in heavy equipment. He managed to get free of the gear, and as he began swimming to the top, the diver tried to give him some air. Unfortunately, this backup regulator was broken. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Naturally, Cameron tried to break free, but the diver thought that he was panicking, and so he continued forcing the regulator into the director's mouth. 
Only by punching the man that came to save him and frantically swimming toward the light did James Cameron live to see another day. God. <laughs> punching him. Uh, that's what you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, Annabelle. Uh, so while filming, director John Leonetti discovered a three-finger marking clawed across a dusty set window. Eerily, the film's demon also had just three fingers. A crew member suffered an injury on a day when the film's doll was brought out in full makeup. While on set, a lighting fixture abruptly fell and struck an actor's head. The same actor played a handyman in the film who is killed by the demon in the very same hallway. The film is inspired by an actual doll believed to be possessed by evil spirits. The real-life Annabelle lives in Lorraine and Ed Warren's occult museum stored safely inside a glass case with a sign warning visitors to leave the door locked. A priest visits the museum and blesses the doll regularly. You know, when I realized and found out that Annabelle doll is actually a Raggedy Ann doll, which I yeah. used to have Raggedy Ann and Andy dolls, I loved them. I was really shook because, holy crap, like, it's not a demon-looking doll. It's a cute Raggedy Ann doll. And who names a Raggedy Ann doll Annabelle? It's her name is Raggedy Ann. Like, what? Who, who is this? Has, I, I must but know. But hasn't the duration of that doll changed over the years? Because you, you, you know how, like, the old, like, the Winnie the Pooh, the original Winnie the Pooh, mm -hmm. doesn't look anything like the one. Yeah. You know, it looks this, raggedy and worn in. This, uh, this so. Raggedy Ann doll is, like, the original ones that are look like flat, flat Stanleys, basically. You know those flat Stanley puppets that they take around and take pictures? Yeah, this is, like, a... Little, like, Hair yeah, with yarn and, hair and like pumpkin cut out facial features. Very, very basic with a little like little house on the prairie dress. Um, yeah, she's literally, she's pretty cute, but uh, has a sordid history that she's in a museum now full of other supposedly haunted artifacts. And she's supposedly one of the most vicious of all of the things Crazy. like anybody who interacts with her has problems yeah and it moves on its own and like they have it on video moving by itself like robert the doll it's crazy no thank you <laughs> i'm glad i didn't know about this doll when i had one i would have thrown that thing in the trash <laughs> <laughs> so i have questions for the host before we wrap everything up mm -hmm. and that is so we already kind of heard Christy touch on it, but what do you guys think? What's coincidence? What is actual curse? What's in between? Oh, I think a lot of these are kind of coincidences. and Because and, I'm pretty sure that if you've been in the game long enough, you can. there's probably a story that everybody has about some freaky or somebody getting hurt on a set. The more people and the more shit you have around, the more likely that there is that something's <laughs> going to happen. Yeah, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But some of these things, I mean... You know, I mean, just think about it, like the apocalypse now thing with the bodies. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that, you know, there's there, that's just somebody just trying to make things realistic a little over overzealously. Yes. <laughs> you know, things like that. The lightning, I will say that the lightning thing is crazy, but I don't know if that's like a curse or just dumb luck. Like, you know, I, I don't, I don't dumb, know. Dumb, bad luck. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, think I just lean on this. Just, you know, shit happens on sets. Yeah, I got to say that some of it is, to me, po quite possibly was cursed, but out of, like, extreme negligence of the people that just don't have a lot of respect for the content that they're, that they're talking about. I think some of this was just coincidence on some of these, but then you've got some where it's just extreme, and if you don't really respect the content and you you know, throw a bunch of dead skeletons in a pool. I just seriously don't feel like there's the respect there for what you're discussing and the content that you're creating, which will probably cause some bad juju, some bad, like, you know what I mean? Like, I just, I don't yeah. feel like everything's a coincidence. I think some of this could be like you are screwing with the wrong thing. And, and that's, when you do that, it can ha that, this can happen. Bad things can happen. Um, but then in other ways, I think some of this was just negligence or, or just bad luck as well. But there's definitely a few of these where you look at them and go, okay, that's just flat out in your face disrespect to the very thing that you're trying to portray on film. And bad things can happen when you feel that way. 
It is true. Yeah, I don't know. It it like I'd mentioned before, it's just it's just a disordinate amount of <laughs> extraordinary, yeah. crazily bad, <clears throat> excuse me, things. I mean, there's a lot of stuff where like stuff happens and maybe in my sheltered little life, but I've never had like a body. I mean, I live by the coast my whole life. And so far as I know, I don't think a body is like washed up right by where I live or, yeah. you know, to have that happen on the Amityville set. It's just some really random, really pointed things that have happened on these film sets. So yeah. I think some are definitely coincidence, but I think others, I'm just like, wow, what are, what are the odds of lightning strikes on two airplanes and lightning strikes on two people? And like, this doesn't, this doesn't reek of just, yeah, that's just a coincidence. So I, at and any I, rate. I also believe, I really do believe that the Dybbuk box one, I really do after watching this story play out, so many times on different, you know, TV series, you know, who are, these are based on what's these people talking who had this happen to them. Um, I just, I really think that this box was, is, is trouble, is bad. It's got, you know, it's got an evil spirit that possesses it. And that's been like the going rate for this box since it was the story was exposed and this is just another story to pile onto the same box this isn't like a fake box or um you know something that's hearsay this is there's just a long line of casualties quote unquote that happen with this box and so i can't deny that anybody who gets around this thing is asking for trouble yeah, for sure. Um, and I, I hadn't heard much about it before this. So I'm interested to hear both of you guys talk about having heard the history of this one before. I'm definitely going to look into that after we get done for the day. But that being said, did anybody have any final thoughts or things they wanted to share? I did not. I'm still trying to figure out what the hell was the name <laughs> still of that movie. That I, that I spent I'm like saying it was a really good thing. You should write a movie minutes. about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's been 100. I mean, I'm not 130. An hour and 30 minutes. Um, just kind of. Um, <laughs> you know, I just it's, it kept me sucked in. It wasn't nothing spectacular, but it wasn't trash. It was just the thing. I don't want to spoil it because I know that I'm gonna probably remember when we finish recording this show. But I kind of spoiled one of the parts of something that happened to you before we, you know, we started recording for the show. I'm telling you, if you don't, if anything doesn't affect you, (laughs) that scene will, you know what I'm saying? And it's kind of at the end of the movie. But I've got to figure this out, y'all. And when I do, I'm going to make sure, as I said earlier, that I'm going to post it to the Facebook page. Um, Outside of that, I was also Diaboleros or something like that. That's Mm -hmm. on uh, Netflix. I've watched the first couple of episodes of that. I didn't mention it earlier. And it seems to be okay. There's a lot of good recommendations here, which I know I needed. So hopefully that helped out the creepers who are struggling to find the next great horror watch as well. I found it. You found it? You ready? Yeah. Is it called Here Alone? I think that that might be it. Well, what is the description? Here Alone is is a post-apocalyptic film directed by Rod Blackhurst. One day when she leaves to find food, she kills one of the infected unknown. Hold on. I'm reading it by Wikipedia, so it's all cut off. Um, sometime after a zombie-like infection decimates the world's population and struggles to survive in the woods, there are few resources and she's forced to live off the land. Abandoned houses attract dangerous infected corpora- corpses throughout and clings to the hope of civilization listening to a crank radio that broadcasts an emergency message in French, a language she does not understand. That past life includes her husband, Jason, and child and infant daughter. Yeah, is that's that it? it? Yeah, I believe. Yeah, that that pretty much. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's definitely it because I remember the radio and the yeah, yeah, that that's it. <laughs> I would say I would say check that out. I think it's only like an hour and a half, hour thirty something minutes or something. Where'd you watch it? I, I don't know. Is it Net- oh. it might have been Netflix. Okay. I think it was Netflix. I don't think that it's, I don't think that it was Shudder because right before we started recording the show, I was like on Shudder and like, who okay. I was like frantically trying to find what it was. I'm almost certain that this was on, um, on Netflix, but. I, wa- I Googled it by right, by typing in horror movie and I don't want to give away the ending, but you kind of told us what happens with her and her baby. And so I Googled that and it brought it up. <laughs> 
I did something similar to that, and then it brought up every friggin' apocalypse mm. movie that's been done at the end of time. So I know that my my search is obviously <laughs> not as good as refining those details. But it's you know, like I said, a lot of people have a lot of time on their hands. Moni, I definitely yeah. would recommend that you check it out. I'm not saying that it's gonna blow your mind, but the the damn baby. <laughs> So that'll be good. Here <laughs> alone, here alone. That's what it's called. Here alone. Yeah. So here alone. very good. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, All right. thanks for those recommendations, everybody. I'm gonna get busy. I now have to go back and watch Poltergeist again, damn it, because it just again. blows my mind. Oh my gosh. I could watch that movie a million times. Yeah, I love me it. Too. Love that I movie. I think that, that even though my favorite my favorite horror film was like the horror comedy Mm -hmm. return of living dead. But when it comes to just a pure horror film, I think, I don't know if many can get as perfect to me as poltergeist. I think that that is my favorite pure horror film, but just fun. I just always, you know, Hey, it's the eighties. And I really identify with some of the, you know, with a lot of the stuff that was going on in return living dead. But poltergeist to me is just totally like, perfect film. It's like amazing. they have everything covered and it is not PG. Mm-hmm. Isn't that what they say the rating is? It's like PG or something stupid? I'm like, oh, no, no, there's no way. Was it R? It uh, had, it, it should be R if it it's not. It has to be R. Nothing scared me more when I was a kid than when that guy peeled his face off. That terrified yeah. me. Terrified that me. That was pretty gross. I, that was gross. To me, it was that fucking clown. Like, no yeah. matter how many times that, oh, yeah. Yeah, it, the clown under the bed. But anyway, it's just such a good movie, oh, man. Woo. Yeah. All right. It is a good movie. And with that, can I get socials from you guys? Where do we find you? Five 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 three two six nine <laughs> seven six. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. <laughs> underscore marker. Militant hey, underscore ladies, marker. there's the number now. Yeah. <laughs> He's Christy. He's asking for somebody to hit him up. Go ahead, y'all. Yeah. Um, tell him how great his movie is that he just recommended. Um, I am creeping at Christy on Instagram and creeping underscore it on Twitter. So y'all reach out. Hey, what you got to lose? We're all here hanging out. We got the time. Heck yeah. And I am Moni Bear across the board. And there is information about um, the comic stuff that I've been doing. If you want to hang out like Friday nights, we will be live with such people as Kelly Sue DeConnick, who actually wrote um, the Captain Marvel series and so on. So if you guys are interested in something like that, what else are we doing? Come hang out with us. You will find that information on my socials at Moni Bear. And with that, thank you, creepers. Stay safe out there. Doesn't make a difference I'll happen once again